Okay. Shabbos, everyone. It's an Arab Shabbos. Arab Shabbos still. There was a, a woman, she was concerned that her husband was losing his hearing. So she, she went to the doctor and said, what should I do? She said, the doctor said, you know what you should do? Stand about 20 feet away from him and ask him, what do you want for dinner? And see uh, if you get a response, and then walk another few feet, 15 feet away, and so forth, and see how far it takes till you hear how much, till you can hear, till he can hear you. So first, she comes home. It's a great idea. She's 20 feet away. So Irving, what do you want for dinner? She doesn't hear an answer. She walks another five feet. She's 15 feet away, and she's a little louder. Irving, what do you want for dinner? Still doesn't hear an answer. She walks a little closer, 10 feet away. He said, Irving, what do you want for dinner? He answers for the third time, chicken. Sometimes we, we think the problem's with someone else when we really have to look at ourselves, see what the issue is. You know, they say, it says in the Talmud to start a, uh, a drush with a joke. So they asked Rabbi Arya Kaplan, the famous author, are there any jokes in the Talmud? He said, yeah, but they're all old. So, you know, this lady should ask him, what do you want for dinner? Our parsha tells us famous words that the whole world knows. A man doesn't live by bread alone, but by everything that comes out from the word of the Lord. That's what, how a human being survives, how we live by the word of God. There was, where I live in White Lake, there are two synagogues right next to each other. One is Orthodox, and one is not. Like they're somewhere between conservative and reform, they haven't decided yet. And the rabbi who was there in the other temple, he would frequent the Orthodox synagogue, because the, the other temple was only open, you know, Friday night and Saturday morning, so all the rest of the week. He was a man who prayed three times a day. He went to the Orthodox synagogue. And the Orthodox rabbi invited him and his wife to have a Sabbath meal with the family. And the rabbi from the conservative temple, he, he said, you know, Rabbi, this week, it was the same week, Parsha Seikov, he said, I want to say something. Our Parsha tells us that a man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that comes out of the mouth of the Lord, of the word of the Lord, that's how a man lives. And I want to tell you, Rabbi, the bread alone I get there in the other temple, but the word of the Lord I get here by you. It's very nice what he said, but he shouldn't sell himself short. And people often sell themselves short. He didn't realize what a powerful position he had to bring the word of the Lord to people who would otherwise not hear it. Hopefully, Whatever he heard, he was able to bring along. And the message that I want to bring out today was really how, in Judaism, you know, we don't talk about going to heaven. It's not something you find in the Bible. It's something you find in the Talmud, in the Kabbalah. In the Bible, all the blessings are here on earth. Because why? The same God who is in heaven is on earth. And if we appreciate Him here, that appreciation will continue into the next world. If we don't appreciate what we have, and we lose out on what we have, and we don't take the, make the most out of it, we could be miserable wherever we are. They say that Shabbos is a taste of the world to come. One-sixtieth of the world to come. So, I remember one of my rabbis in, in high school, he said that there are certain people that keep Shabbos very faithfully and very piously, but when Shabbos is almost over, they're sitting around, when is it going to be over already? Something like that, when they come to the next world, they're also going to be sitting around, when is it going to be over already? It's never going to be over. 
On the other hand, there are other people who, they don't want to leave Shabbos. I, I, I remember the dorm counselor where I went to college, he told a story that his grandfather called him once right after Shabbos ended. And he was in a different college in, the, in the Washington Heights in Manhattan. And his grandfather said, come with me as soon as Shabbos ends. And he drove him to Williamsburg. So all the way down the whole Manhattan to Williamsburg. He said, I want you to re recognize something. Up in Washington Heights, Shabbos ended an hour ago. And here in Williamsburg, it's still Shabbos. Certain people, they, they don't want to leave. And they can appreciate that. And, and with that type of attitude, they can be happy, not just in the next world, they can be happy in this world. They can enjoy and appreciate everything they have. It says twice in our parsha, V'chalta v'savata. You shall eat, and you shall be satisfied. Almost as a command. You should eat and enjoy it. Be satisfied. Be full. Enjoy the good things God gives you. The first time he says that in our in our Torah reading, it says, Hashem You should eat and you should be satisfied, and you should bless the Lord your God for the good things He gave you. From there we derive that there's a mitzvah from the Torah to thank God after you eat. We all know about the blessings before the meals. But, you know, like for example, there was a, a Jew, he was lost in the forest, and a bear came after him, <coughs> so he started dawdling Shema Yisrael, but then he heard the bear, so the bear went and got a yarmulke out of his pocket and put it on his head. He said, oh, it's a Jewish bear. I don't have to worry. The landsman, you know. And he's also starting to say something. In Hebrew, what is he saying? Uh oh. <laughs> it wasn't the, I guess he's getting ready to eat. That's uh, that's before we eat, which is very important. The Talmud tells us that there's twice in the Psalms that at one time, in Psalm 24, it says the Lord is the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Later, in the Psalm 115, it says the heaven is the heaven of the Lord. And the earth he gave to the human beings. So which is it? Does the world, the earth, belong to God, or did he give it to human beings? The, the Talmud answers, before you thank God for something, it still belongs to God. And if you take it without thanking him, you're stealing. But once you say a bracha, then God gives it to you. That's what the Talmud says. That's before we eat. But still, we say that to say a blessing before we eat is a rabbinical law. It's not a biblical commandment. But to say a blessing after we eat, the benching that we have after eating, that many people are not aware of, is actually a biblical commandment. I remember a great rabbi of Queens, Rabbi Olbaum, he, he asked this question, and he brought from various sources. He said, how come we see people take prayer with more kavana, more seriousness, and more intention, more devotion, and benching after meals, sometimes even people, even if they're doing it, they might not be paying attention so much. And, and actually it says that for the blessing, for being with joy after you, you, uh, after you eat and benching, saying the, the grace after meals, that you're blessed with riches. So why is it that people don't pay attention? It's also in our Parsha. Because it says in our Parsha that be careful. It says, in the second paragraph of the Shema. And then it says, be careful. And elsewhere in the parsha, it says, you're going to get full and you're going to forget God. It's so easy after we indulge in the physical world to forget that God is the one who gave us all of that. But that's the challenge that we have in life. That's what it's all about. That's why we're here. That's why, the, even though, of course, there's an afterlife, there's no question about that in Judaism. There has to be. It doesn't make sense otherwise. The basic dogma of Judaism <coughs> is that there's reward and punishment. And since we see this world is not fair, 
So fairness has to be meted out somewhere. And furthermore, it's basic dogmas of Judaism that the Messiah is going to come, there'll be a resurrection of the dead. These are all basic dogmas. But, the Bible is a much more earthy book. It says it's not in heaven that you should ask where is it. It's here in your mouth, in your heart to do it. So Moses tells us, and it's God who told him to say this, it's God talking to him. We have to be careful. It's more than that. Someone might say, Everything I have, I, I, I did it myself. Rather, you have to remember that God is the one who gives you the strength to do it. And yes, it's an incredible thing to accomplish things, and God gave us that gift to enjoy. That's how much He loved us, that He gave us a gift of enjoying the accomplishments that we achieve. We, but the challenge is, again, after such achievements, to remember, where did the, that possibility come from? Is from our Creator who made it possible. And in that sense, we can bring joy to every aspect of our life. Because really, everything we experience in life can become an experience of God's love. Really, we don't want to talk about bad things, but really even the things we can perceive as bad, we can still have a relationship with God in that. But all the more so, if we look and reflect on how much good things God gives us, you know, my wife just had a baby. It's so hard to try to inculcate, right? You hold the baby and you feel that joy and you see God's gift to you. But what about the next moment? You can forget, it's so easy. You know, I took my kids out, we enjoyed it. The other night, my wife was home with the baby and she needed to get the kids out of the house. And we had tickets to a concert. We went to a fun concert, and we, it was very enjoyable. We have to recognize, it's so easy to forget, <coughs> that God is the one who made everything in the universe, including our capability of enjoyment. We have to constantly thank Him for that. So that's what it means, that man doesn't live by bread alone. That's what it means, be eat and be satisfied and thank God for everything that He gives you. But also to be careful not to forget God in those, in those uh, aspects. And it's so easy to forget and that's the challenge of life. That's what we're here for. That's really our purpose. Why were we put in this world? Why didn't God just keep our souls in heaven where we could experience Him clearly and plainly without any doubt, without any difficulty? Because he loved us so much, the Kabbalists teach, that he wanted to give us the most enjoyment possible. And when someone gets something for free, without any difficulty, without earning it, he can't really appreciate it. But when someone works on something, and accomplishes something, and overcomes difficulties, and overcomes obstacles, and reaches a goal, that enjoyment makes something much more enjoyable than it could be without it. No matter what it is. I mean, even if it was, the, in its essence, something more meager, but by virtue of our effort and our accomplishments, we feel like we accomplished something. And that, too, is ultimately a gift of God that feeling of accomplishment, that feeling that we did something good. And it's so easy, we could think, oh, we did it. And that's a challenge. But, so then, we overcome that challenge, which is even more of a challenge, much harder than an accomplishment of keeping Shabbos, keeping kosher, praying three times a day, putting on tefillin every weekday, wearing tzitzis, all these things, remembering to say blessings, all these things, even studying, even studying the whole Talmud. All of those things are easy compared to this tremendous challenge of 
recognizing God in all of those things, not losing the forest through the trees. And so some people say, oh, we'd be better off without all of that. You know, there was a story, Rabbi Israel Heldesheimer, one of the great leaders of German Jewry, the man came to him and he said, you know, we need to streamline this Judaism, it's too hard. How are we going to do it? It's too much. Let's cut it in half. Let's, and do, and really put all our effort in that other half that we keep and forget about the rest. He said, this is what it sounds like. Say someone owes someone money. And he makes a deal with the one he owes money to. He said, you know, I, I owe you $600. I'll give you $300 and you'll forget the whole debt. He said, all right, it's better something than nothing. Give me the cash here today. I'll forget the rest, even though it's half. So he ripped up the first IOU. And he wrote a new IOU for $300. He said, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you got to give it, you want me to rip up the first IOU, you got to pay cash. You can't give me a new IOU for half. The same thing. God is merciful. Even if we're never going to do everything right, but at least when we know that we have something to live up to, we have a standard, that's a great gift. That's worth more than everything something to strive for, even if we won't make it. And even if we make it, there's still what to do better. Because God is infinite and we are imperfect. So there's always room for improvement. And that gift of the ability to constantly grow and strive and work hard and appreciate that accomplishment and overcome the feeling that we did it ourselves, we can feel proud of ourselves. 100% we should feel proud of that. But that pride has to come from the pride of Israel, Almighty God, the one who gave us the power to do all that. And if we take him out of the picture, it's not worth it. And if we say, we don't owe you all of this, we lose out. But if we realize, all right, we're trying our best, maybe we're not even trying our best. But we, we believe and know with all our hearts that there is a standard to live up to. Even if we'll never live up to it. But we want to, somewhere in our hearts, and we believe in it, we're not heretics. We'll try our best, but we'll try what we can do. Then God could be merciful, and because we could be humble before Him, and recognize that we need His help for everything. And then He'll help us along, and help us to be happy, and help us to enjoy life, because everything we do, ultimately, can be an expression of that relationship that we have with the One who made everything our families, our friends, our, four, our five senses, that we can appreciate all this, our brains, our bodies, everything we have, the food that we eat, all the people and machines and animals and plants that were involved to bring us, the people who made the roads and the materials for the roads and everything we have, all comes from God. And when we think about that and meditate upon that, and realize how every blade of grass, every flower, every animal, every person we meet, every cell and molecule in our atom and subatomic particle in our bodies, and our very souls are all gifts from God, love letters from God, expressions of God's love. How can we help but to feel a measure of happiness? It's just hard. We've got to work on that. It's not easy. But it's our job. And even if we don't accomplish it, even if we try it once a day, once a week, once a month, once a year, to reflect on that. Maybe even once in a lifetime. That can make our whole lives worth it. And give us the power to hear and to recognize everything when we come up to the next world everything that we have to enjoy that and to bask in the glow of God's joy.